Yes, everybody. Uh, I'm joining you today from the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. My name is David Eby. I'm BC's Attorney General and Minister responsible for housing. In British Columbia, we face a housing crisis. Uh, we have a serious housing affordability problem, and the challenges uh, that we faced before the pandemic were only magnified by them. Uh, in our most recent homeless counts, Many communities saw uh, either a small increase or a large increase uh, in homelessness, and we need to do more. And one of the key opportunities for government is to uh, move upstream, to identify the feeders into homelessness and to interrupt those feeders so that people don't become homeless in the first place, or if they are homeless, they're homeless for as short a period of time as possible. To that end, we have committed the largest housing investment in BC's history, $7 billion over a decade. We've made good progress towards our goal of 114,000 homes over 10 years. In four years, we have over 32,000 new affordable homes completed or underway in more than 100 communities across British Columbia. Over 4,400 supportive homes have been opened, another 2,100 are underway, and more than 2,000 people have been moved inside out of homelessness since our last homeless counts. We worked closely with community and municipal partners to bring hundreds of people inside and did so throughout the pandemic, bringing, opening 3, 000, more than 3,000 temporary spaces for people from encampments to come indoors. Over the winter season, we opened more than 1,900 temporary shelter spaces and almost 500 extreme weather response spaces. Budget 22 uh, commits to expand this work and help us be strategic about it. Overall, there is $633 million in the budget to expand services and quickly help people experiencing homelessness become stably housed. This includes $264 million over three years to ensure the approximately 3,000 people who came indoors during the pandemic into temporary housing will have permanent and stable housing. This will assist us in acquiring and operating that permanent housing for this population. It will also enable us to extend the leases of those sites where we are able to do so, so that nobody is forced back into homelessness. Also in the budget, we have a new supported rent supplement program. This is a $600 per month supplement for families and individuals, which also gives them access to integrated health and social supports, healthcare, food services, and employment training. This will assist up to 3,000 households over the next three years. All of this will support the ongoing work happening to develop our provincial homelessness strategy, and we'll have more to share on that later this year. With that, I would like to turn things over to the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, Sheila Malcolmson. Sheila, go ahead. Thank you, Minister E.B. I'm you this morning glad to be joining you this morning from Sunday Honored to stand with, honored to stand with Ministers E.B., Simons and Dean as our government acts together on homelessness. Every person in British Columbia deserves a home where they feel safe and live with dignity. For too long, people who suffered serious mental health and addiction challenges were left behind. Their complex needs often led to a cycle of eviction, shelters, emergency rooms, sometimes jail, and they were all too often left to homelessness. That's why Premier Horgan asked me to create complex care housing for people for whom supportive housing has not been enough. And in January, my Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions launched a first of its kind complex care housing program with four initial projects. It's a groundbreaking approach to address the needs of people with overlapping mental health, substance use, trauma, and often acquired brain injury. Of the four initial projects launched in January, in Surrey, complex care housing residents start moving into their new homes at the Foxglove Project, March 28. And complex care housing services have started for people already in the Abbotsford and two Vancouver projects. Now, February's budget invests $164 million over three years to build 20 complex care housing projects, serving 500 people, vulnerable people across British Columbia. This new system of care will connect clients to the services that they need right in their homes, will help establish stability, connect.
to primary care and life-saving supports provided by healthcare professionals like nurses. Complex care housing will serve people who need help that goes beyond supportive housing. This includes people at risk of eviction because their complex needs have not been met before. Complex care housing is voluntary, it's delivered through health authorities, and it includes direct connections to treatment and specialized care and support from peer workers, nurses, social workers, and other health professionals. This is another important step as we prevent homelessness and build the comprehensive system of care for mental health and addictions that people need. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, very much uh, Minister Malcolmson, for sharing that with us today. At this point, I would like to introduce Stephen D'Souza. Stephen is the Executive Director of the Homelessness Services Association of British Columbia. Stephen, go ahead. Thank you, Minister. Good morning. Uh, as I listen to these announcements today, what's really exciting for me in thinking about these investments and support is that it signals a new approach. It's looking across government in partnership with community and persons with living experience to broaden housing options and increase the availability of wraparound supports. This will have a direct and meaningful impact in people's lives. Now, I think the challenge for government and really for all of us is how do we leverage these investments and supports to transform our systems to better address the root causes of homelessness? So in the weeks ahead, I look forward to having deeper conversations about how these announcements today will be implemented and how a comprehensive cross-government strategy can help end homelessness in BC. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Stephen. Now I would like to introduce Mitzi Dean. Mitzi is the Minister of Children and Family Development for the province of British Columbia. Go ahead, Mitzi. And uh, good morning, everyone. Tiana Square, Nasne, Mitzi Dean. I go by she, her pronouns. And I just spoke in the Lekwungen language to show my deep appreciation for and respect for the land that I'm joining you from today. Um, indeed, today I'm on the, the territory of the Chianu Nation. Um, and I appreciate everybody being here for this really important announcement. The late youth housing advocate, Catherine McParland, called the transition from government care a superhighway to homelessness. We know that without more supports, young adults from care are so much more likely to suffer negative outcomes, including becoming homeless. It's in our power to change this. And that's what we aim to do with the new supports that are in budget 2022. Most parents do everything that they can to help their, their youth transition successfully to independence and adulthood. And children and youth in government care need to know we're going to be there for them too. Through this new funding, we're offering wraparound support that will help young people make that strong transition to independence. Over the next three years, the improved system will help more young people in more ways. The new support major improvements to those supports. That includes one year unconditional income supplement of $1,250 a month, plus a no limit earnings exemption for young people. So they have an incentive to work and to build that independence for themselves and expanded medical and health benefits. The new system will give young people improved health and life skills supports and earlier more direct transition help as well from the age of 14. And our new approach will help young people stay housed and avoid homelessness. Youth in care will be able to stay where they're living up to their 21st birthday. And we've been providing this option to the youth through the pandemic. And I'm really happy to say that this housing option is now extended indefinitely. We'll also be offering a rent supplement of up to $600 a month so that when young people are ready to transition, they can secure safe and stable housing. We've been hearing from youth for years. And that is what is driving these changes. And I sincerely want to thank all of the advocates, Catherine, Tanji and Stephen, and all of the young people who have shared their stories and pushed for these much needed changes for so many years. 
This is the first time the province has created a comprehensive cross-government approach to supporting youth in and from care. And I so look forward to working with our sector partners and other ministries over the coming years as we put more changes in place so that young people can experience better support as soon as possible. Youth transitioning to adulthood need supports and tools and relationships to help them thrive. And yet for so many years, these supports were not enough or were simply non-existent. I hope when young people in and from care hear about this announcement, they also hear, we care about you. We believe in you. We're showing youth and children in care that they matter by offering wraparound supports that don't just provide the bare minimum to survive, but give them the supports they need and, and so that they can excel and reach their full potential. Supports that will allow them to be independent, not system dependent. As young people tell me, they want to thrive, not just survive. Thank you, Heidschke. Thank you, Minister Dean. I'd now like to introduce Nicholas Simons, the Minister of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. Go ahead, Nick. Good morning. Um, I'm joining you this morning from the territory of the Tla'aman Nation, a modern treaty nation on the Upper Sunshine Coast here. And it's, I'm very pleased to be a part of today's announcement uh, to outline three specific actions that the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction is taken to help people who are at risk of or who are experiencing homelessness. Today, I wanna to talk about these three specific actions. First, we'll be partnering with nonprofit associations to provide tenant startup kits to help people who are removing from homelessness into more stable housing. These kits will include some basic essentials that we all need when setting up house, like dishes, bedding and towels, or cleaning supplies. Second, for people on income assistance or disability assistance and experiencing homelessness and not receiving a shelter allowance, the province will be providing them with a new minimum rate. This new minimum allowance of $75 for a single person will help with incidental expenses. So for those who are not receiving a shelter allowance, this $75 will automatically be added to assistance payments starting this April. Third, over the next three years, we'll be more than doubling the number of community integration specialists on our teams. Community integration specialists help people in need navigate government services and programs. The role of community integration specialists started as a pilot project in 2019. People aren't always aware of the programs and services that might be able to help them. This change can, this can be due to a lack of awareness or challenges with digital literacy, hesitation to engage with government or other barriers. Community integration specialists help people become aware of and link them to government programs and services. Some people don't always feel comfortable visiting government offices, so community integration specialists go to people where they are. They support people in temporary housing, shelters, and sleeping rough by connecting them to services. And they also help connect them to specialty navigators, such as those in the healthcare system, in mental health, in addictions, and to help them secure housing and other core services. We aim to increase the number of community integration specialists from the current 73 to over 190 throughout the province. Increasing their number will allow us to better serve Indigenous populations and remote communities. So these are some of the ways we're working to close the gaps and build better supports for people in need. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Simons. Our last speaker today is Tanji Genshorek. Tanji is the Executive Director of Away Home Kamloops. Tanji, over to you. E.B., thank you for having me here today. I'm joining you all from the unceded territory of the Shukwetmik people in our lovely community of Kamloops to Shukwetmik. It's a real honor to be here today. Um, thank you all for, for inviting us. The staff and youth at Away Home Kamloops are 
really relieved to hear about the increases in, in funding and support coming. Um, we are very heartened that the relevant ministries are coming together to solve issues and address gaps for some of the most underserved members of our communities. We look forward to being part of the ongoing process along with other organizations across the province, such as Aunt Leah's Place and Covenant House um, to offer insight from the viewpoint of youth and continue to bring their standpoint to the work and, and make sure we're doing what's going to be best for those people that we're serving. Youth who are transitioning out of government care are particularly vulnerable and we're grateful that our calls to action are being heard. We would also like to congratulate those who have worked really hard to make these significant changes in budget 2022. And we thank you for listening and we thank you for caring. The founder of Away Home Kamloops, Catherine McParland, was a former youth in care. And as Minister Dean pointed out, she often spoke about the superhighway to homelessness. She would be very excited today to be able to visualize a different future where we can support vulnerable youth and lift them up to independence instead of leaving them to suffer. This budget can mark the beginning of a significant shift where we are all working together to make sure that people aren't falling through the cracks, a shift to seeing what people need instead of judging them for what they don't have, and a shift to caring instead of questioning them. This is still just the beginning, and we will all have to work very hard to make this shift that we can now visualize a reality. Uh, we here at Away Home Kamloops look forward to helping do that work. Thank you so much. much. Thank you very much, Tanji. We'd be happy now to take any questions from the media. Thank you to all our speakers. As a reminder for reporters on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. That's star one to ask a question. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Please also remember to take your phone off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. Our first question today is from Rob Shaw, Czech News. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, it's been two months since government announced the first complex care housing program sites and the four sites in Surrey, Abbotsford, and Vancouver. I haven't seen any of these other sites. We just went through the budget with 20 new locations supposedly announced. Where are they and why is it taking this long to uh, tell us where they are? Thanks, Rob. We'll turn this question over to Minister Sheila Malcolmson. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, so the first four projects that we announced, first time that we've used this model uh, back in January, real progress on all four of them. And we're starting to learn from the model um, as in the Fox Club project in Surrey, people are moving into the end of this month. Um, Naomi Place in Vancouver, we're hiring right now. That's going to be 39 spots. Um, it'll be fully operational in April. And uh, Jim Green also will be fully operational in April. Uh, and the um, Abbotsford project starting to be phased in. Um, so already for the first 100 people out of the 500 that this a uh, total funding envelope is going to provide that dignified wraparound uh, complex care housing. Um, you know, we really wanted to, to choose the projects that we could get the most immediate results and start to get feedback around about how, whether it's actually meeting people's needs and what kind of people we need to support. We received from all the health authorities across the province, 120 proposals. Uh, so it did take us some time in the fall with the health authorities to identify based on a healthcare need um, and which ones could get the quickest results the fastest. We have chosen the locations for the others um, and that announcement is coming up um, in the very near future and we'll make sure that you're there for that, uh, that reveal. Um, there's so much work that's being talked about today at a cross government level about how we're uh, preventing homelessness um, from all of the access points that are identified in Minister Eby's work. And uh, so this is our first step, um, but, uh, but we'll have news very soon on the specific projects. Uh, we're determined to have the service available in every part of the province. Um, and these first 20 projects um, will reveal that. 
Rob, did you have a follow-up? Sure. I guess just for Minister Malcolmson again, your community of Nanaimo certainly would like one of these uh, complex care sites in Victoria, which has been the site of a big investment from government in the unhoused, uh, would like at least one. So can you at least tell the, those two communities on the island that they've met the cut here for the locations and you can announce the actual location later, but they're both wondering what's going on and, and whether they're going to see these sites. You know, we are in very good contact with the municipal leaders of those communities. Uh, the Urban Mayor's Caucus, Union of BC Municipalities, uh, both helped build the framework. They were um, deeply involved in the uh, core planning table that established this new form of housing last summer. Um, we've been regularly briefing them. Um, I met with the mayor of Kelowna just uh, two days ago, um, another community that very much wants to see this service. Uh, we all feel the urgency across government. Uh, we're grateful to municipal partners and all the people working on the front line that have helped us gather the evidence that identifies both where the need is the deepest, but also where we can get people connected with care immediately. This is not a capital project. This is not something that we are going to build and have a you know, multi-year runway. These are uh, complex care housing units for people at risk of homelessness right now um, for where the, the need is urgent. We're going to get them up as fast as they can, uh, as we can. Um, and, and we'll have news uh, very soon about which communities are, are going to be the first hosts of this groundbreaking new model of care. Our next question. Our next question is from Chad Klassen, CFJC TV. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Actually, similar to uh, exactly similar to what Rob was talking about in terms of complex care, uh, Kamloops has been another community that's been uh, pushing for that. And I noticed in the first four that you had announced complex care, there was actually uh, there were actually none in the interior. Can you uh, can you tell residents uh, in Kamloops or the interior that uh, complex care is coming? We'll turn this question also over to Minister Malcolmson. We've um, been in good contact with, with Kamloops, some also very active participants in our planning process. This is a service that is health authority led. Lots of cooperation, of course, from BC Housing. And again, an example of across government, how we're working together. Health authorities identified based on a health care need, unmet uh, primary care uh, mental health and addictions care and people living with acquired brain injury, and then also meshed with what are the projects that are already being built where we could add, for example, as we did at Naomi Place, basically an extra floor of complex care housing uh, supports and units to a building already being constructed. So we are going to continue to work um, with health authorities and with municipalities to get this new urgently needed model of housing, both homelessness prevention um, and 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 attending to homelessness for the most vulnerable people up as quickly as we can. Um, and it's the premier's and my commitment that this will be available in every health authority of the province. January's announcement only affected two health authorities, but again, chosen just based on which ones we could um, start moving people into uh, by fiscal year end, um, which we are doing. We'll have news for um, all the other communities that have been calling for this uh, um, in the coming weeks. Chad, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just quickly. I, I know uh, it was uh, spoken about uh, rep, uh, sorry, rent supplements, uh, six hundred dollars per month, uh, which is great for individuals and families. But in terms of the unhoused, this is probably a question for uh, Minister Eby. Uh, in Camel specifically, I know it's hard to, to throw throw numbers out there, but ha given what we, the report that just came out, how much housing? New housing is needed, do you think, in a place like Kamloops, Minister Eby? In uh, fast-growing communities like Kamloops, um, there are a number of different types of housing needed. Without question, uh, we need additional rental housing across the province, including in Kamloops. Uh, market rental housing is often not seen as connected to homelessness. This is for people with uh, middle-income salaries or higher. Uh, but when that housing is built, it uh, takes pressure off lower income rental housing and removes those incentives for landlords to evict lower income tenants in order to bring in uh, higher income tenants that can pay more for rent. So if I were to uh, prescribe just one type of housing, not just for Kamloops, but uh, across the province that we urgently need more of, it's certainly rental housing. 
For Kamloops specifically, we've been working very closely with the mayor and council on the urgent homelessness situation there, both in identifying temporary shelter spaces, but also uh, longer term supportive housing, and as Minister Malcolmson said, uh, complex care housing. So we'll need the full spectrum of housing uh, in Kamloops and in many communities like Kamloops that are experiencing this rapid growth. Um, and uh, where that housing goes and, uh, and uh, what it looks like, all these issues uh, should be dealt with by the local council and I think we're very much of a mind with the city council at the provincial level about what's needed there. Our next question is from Marcella Bernardo, CBC. Please go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for taking my question. Sorry to monopolize your time asking questions about Kamloops, but is, is there any specific information you can share about what is coming to Kamloops timeline-wise with complex care and, and perhaps giving us a number of how many community integration specialists are dedicated to this region? Um, earlier this week we heard from the superintendent of the RCMP saying that a lot of the RCMP calls now are dealing with mental health issues, so the sooner the better, and hopefully you can give us a more or finite timeline as to when complex care is actually going to be available in Kamloops. Okay, we're going to turn this question back over to Minister Malcolmson on complex care. Thanks, Minister Eby. Uh, again, grateful to Kamloops Council and all the municipalities that helped us build the complex care housing model that we've been keeping regular um, updates, uh, keeping the Urban Mayor's Caucus and BC municipalities uh, well informed. I was in the interior the first two days of this week and very grateful to meet with uh, Kelowna and Vernon mayors, some also advocates for more mental health and substance use services in their communities. Um, every community in the province contending with a rising tide of demand for substance use and mental health services. You know, honestly, the province was in a hole uh, when we took government immediately in 2017, started building that system of care for mental health and addictions that didn't exist before. But the pandemic in every way has been a setback. Homelessness, the most vulnerable people um, in the province that um, Minister Dean and Minister Simons are working along, alongside, uh, and of course, the terrible increase in toxicity of drugs and the exacerbation of the overdose crisis. It's very hard for every community and, and, and including Kamloops. I'm feeling it in my own home as well. We'll have news for the next wave of complex care housing. Uh, we will be standing with municipal leaders and making those announcements in the coming weeks. Um, at every place in the spectrum of mental health and substance use care, we're adding more addiction treatment beds. We're adding more community-based counseling. We're adding, uh, with the health authorities, prescribed safe supply to separate people from the toxic drug supply and working closely with policing to be able to better utilize police resources to focus on the true crime, adding wherever we can community care, uh, nurses, outreach teams that are able to attend to the most vulnerable people. We're doing that with situation tables. We're doing that. Um, complex care housing will be a, will be a help as well. Uh, this is a cross government initiative. We all feel the deep urgency for we recognize municipal leaders are at the very front edge of that, but we, we are working together. We have to, and today's announcement is testament to that. Marcella, did you, Marcella, did you have a follow-up? I did, and it's actually a question on behalf of one of my colleagues for Minister Attorney General E.B. Uh, about housing. How is the migration of people from other provinces impacting housing affordability in this province, and where are we seeing them actually coming from? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so in the last uh, quarter for which we have data, the last three-month period, uh, we had uh, about 18,000 uh, people move to British Columbia from other countries, and about 5,000 people move to British Columbia from other provinces. Uh, we're seeing people come from all across Canada, but particularly Alberta and Ontario. And the impact of this is quite significant in terms of the fact that we were already uh, grappling with a uh, housing crisis of affordability and the availability of rental housing with the existing population in the province. Uh, and uh, when you add uh, 25,000, uh, almost 25,000 new people every three months to the province, uh, that issue becomes quite serious. This was a 30-year high in in-migration from other provinces and other countries. 
at the same time as we had a 30-year low in the number of multiple uh, of listings for real estate on the multiple listing service, as well as vacancy rates below 1% in most of the major cities in the province. Uh, so this is a huge amount of pressure, and obviously um, uh, Minister uh, Cullen uh, is working with the federal government in relation to the potential inflow of a significant number of refugees from Ukraine, uh, which will also uh, amplify these challenges. We have a lot of work to do, and we're looking uh, certainly to the federal government for support in relation to housing. They're committed to welcoming 300,000 new Canadians every year for the next three years, a significant portion of whom will end up in Ontario and British Columbia. And if those are the immigration targets the federal government is working on, we're really going to need their support in delivering more housing, uh, in, and quite urgently, uh, in order to avoid additional pressure that drives homelessness and unaffordability for British Columbians. Our next question is from Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, Ms. Minister Eby, I'm looking at a briefing note recently from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives on the government's housing plan. Uh, says, quote, overall the B.C. government performance to date is still far too modest to make a real dent in housing affordability, and it also says by their census that many of the units that have been announced already are merely initiated. They are far from being ready for people to move in and complete it. Is there a comment from the CCPA? Uh, well, uh, a couple of points. Uh, one is, uh, uh, to some extent, um, the, the comments are fair in the sense that we have committed $7 billion to opening new housing, but many of these housing units are challenged in municipal approvals processes. We have uh, projects that have been in the pipeline at the municipal level for far too long. And one of the challenges that comes from that is not only that people can't move into them, but uh, the inflation that we're seeing around construction costs impacts the budgets and the, viab the very viability of these projects. So I've been working with municipalities across the province to try to encourage them to accelerate these processes, to prioritize affordable housing developments, to get them open. With that said, uh, I think the comments aren't fair in the sense that uh, we have opened literally tens of thousands of new housing units uh, since forming government. Since forming government, we've housed about uh, 3,500 people who were previously unhoused. During the pandemic, 3,000 people into uh, temporary accommodation who will no longer be homeless. We're going to transition them from temporary sites into permanent sites thanks to this budget announcement. A brand new and revolutionary approach to youth and care to avoid them uh, ending up homeless, as you heard from Minister Dean, from Minister Malcolmson. A brand new and revolutionary approach in terms of people with mental health and addiction issues uh, that are struggling in supportive care. There's a group we didn't even hear about uh, under the previous government. So I think that sometimes uh, groups that are enthusiastic about housing, like the CCPA and others, uh, can uh, hope for perfection and I hope they continue to hope for perfection. But I think there are a number of really positive things that we've delivered and in the areas where we've run into challenges of, of getting the money and the funding that we've committed turning into open uh, doors for people to move into, uh, we're working on that too. We're working in partnership with municipalities through Minister Cullen uh, to accelerate uh, those approvals and get those doors open so people can move in. Vaughn, did you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Uh, Minister Eby, struck by your comments on local government, uh, I've been noticing lately some pushback from some local government officials, councillors, and so forth, uh, saying, uh, expressing that the provincial government is getting ready to intrude into local government jurisdiction over housing approvals. Um, is it still your intention uh, to proceed with legislation along those lines in the fall, and are those local government concerns justified? Um, obviously, given the uh, massive 30-year high in migration to British Columbia, even before uh, the possibility of literally thousands of people from Ukraine moving to British Columbia, I feel a huge sense of urgency to get as much housing approved and built, especially rental housing, as we can. And I have very little time for arguments like I saw in Burnaby Now about a major rental housing development that's affordable, that has childcare, and there's somebody in the paper saying, I'm really, uh, I think that there's going to be an impact on parking in our neighborhood. 
This is an urgent situation. And so uh, I, I'm very grateful uh, to those mayors and those councillors who are hearing this message. I see it. I see it in their approvals, in their uh, changing processes to move faster to get more housing open. And I think it's right for those mayors to say, hey, look, we're doing all we can. Uh, we're trying to get this done. And we hear what you're saying. And we share your concerns. But there are also uh, city councils that don't uh, have that perspective. And so I'm working closely with Minister Cullen in terms of what the provincial government can do in partnership with UBCM and partnership with municipalities uh, and how we can encourage that delivery of housing. Uh, it might be legislation, it might be something else, but I'm, I'm very uh, uh, obviously very concerned about this. I think this is the big opportunity to open more housing, uh, to address the crisis not only that we're facing, but that is going to get worse uh, if we don't see signif significant action. Our next question is from Amy Smart, CP. Please go ahead. Hi there. I have a question for Tanji. Um, you said um, this is kind of the start of what you'd like to see. I'm wondering if you can describe what the most urgent ongoing issues are that you'd like to see in the strategy or that aren't identified in this budget. Over to Tanji from Away Home Kamloops Society. Thanks so much. Yeah, there's there's a lot of moving parts to all of these uh, fantastic announcements. There's so many things that we have to um, detail out that uh, we just really look forward to being part of the process of uh, the ongoing conversation. Um, the current administration has been fantastic about engaging community and responding to what we hear directly from youth and listening to youth directly. And we just really want to see that continue and grow and provide the input and the details on, on, on every part of, of what's going to continue to roll out. So really just developing um, processes for that, that back and forth and, and those conversations and, and uh, ways to continue to provide our feedback is, is our, our basically our key goal that will help us make everything stronger. Amy, did you have a follow up? Um, yeah, on a different topic, I noticed in the budget, there's also $4 million for BC housing to offer services to encampments. Um, is this a signal to the government's in support of encampments, or how do they fit into your housing strategy? The camera back. Thank you for the question. So across the province, we have a significant number of encampments. These, some of these are small. It's a group of four or five people uh, in the bush. Uh, some of them are quite large. Uh, I know Abbotsford is grappling with uh, an encampment right now. The challenge that we have uh, is twofold. One is for encampments like in Crab Park in Vancouver, uh, the decision by the court not to grant the park board an injunction, uh, even though uh, there was uh, sufficient and available dignified shelter for people to move into, uh, means that that encampment is going to be there for a while as the park, park board determines its next steps. Uh, it's not sufficient to say that the encampment is just going to sit there and we have no uh, role to play as provincial government in supporting a city and providing minimal services in an encampment where the court has said it has to stay there. So providing things like porta potties, showers and other things, both to minimize the impact of the encampment on the surrounding community, but also to provide a little bit of dignity to the people who are living in the encampment uh, is an important thing to do and that costs money. So it's in the budget. Also, there are encampments where um, I, I think, ultimately, uh, both the City Council and uh, the Provincial Government are committed to a plan to decamp those sites, just like we did in Victoria and Vancouver, but it takes time to open the supportive housing to deliver that. So while the encampment is there, while we're opening the supportive housing and working with people on the site to find appropriate housing for them, uh, again, providing basic uh, dignified services uh, is important to minimize impact and also uh, provide some humanity and dignity for the people who live there. That does not mean at all that the provincial government supports encampments. We do not. They are not safe for the people who live there. Uh, parks and uh, abandoned lots and uh, so on are not appropriate locations for supportive housing or, uh, or and neither is a tent 
uh, a recognition of the right to dignified shelter. Uh, so we continue to work in partnership with municipalities to get people inside. Uh, this budget and these budget announcements talk about how we can do that with things like rent supplements for someone who might be in an encampment and could go right into rental housing. These are all tools that we have now uh, in today's budget announcement that enable us to move forward with things like decampment. Uh, that $4 million is in relation to these encampments that for one reason or another uh, are going to be there in the short term. Our next question is from Victor Kaiser, Radio NL. Please go ahead. Hi, Ministers. I guess thanks for doing this. And uh, I must say three questions from Kamloops is pretty good to hear. But uh, I was uh, curious about Bill 26 that, uh, you know, there's been some concern at City Council just on the lack of, I guess, required or mandatory public hearings, if you will. The CHBA is in favor of it. But I suppose... What would you do to speak to those concerns? I guess this question is for Minister E.B. perhaps, just those concerns that maybe you're eroding some of that uh, uh, local democracy, if you will, taking away some people's rights to maybe have a say if they want to in some certain projects, things like that. Thanks for the question. The question is in relation to uh, an, an enabling uh, statute. This is something that gives permission for cities uh, to do something, but they don't have to. It was brought in by the former Minister of Municipal Affairs, Jody, Josie Osborne. Uh, so Minister Osborne's legislation allows cities where they have an official community plan and there's a rezoning that would match that official community plan, it's consistent with the plan, to not have to do another public hearing. Um, so, uh, usually when an official community plan is developed, uh, everybody participates across the city, different stakeholders are consulted, a uh, plan is made for what the municipality is going to look like, where the housing is going to go, where industry is going to be, where commercial areas are and so on, where the growth is going to focus. Um, the idea that after that extensive public process, that then you would need another public hearing to make the underlying zoning consistent with that community plan that everyone has already endorsed and signed off on is, in my opinion, an example of the excessive process that delays the delivery of important housing and uh, and it's a very frustrating thing you know the the city says that something is approved to go in this site thanks to the uh, uh, approval of the official community plan somebody purchases that site on that promise goes to City Council says I would like it rezoned to be consistent with the official community plan and then they say well actually you have to go through another public hearing even though the public has already approved the official community plan so it's not at all uh, an erosion of participation rights what it is is an, an efficiency of it that you're doing it at the citywide level at the plan level rather than each individual parcel throughout an entire municipality the impacts of those hearings are significant both in terms of the costs of any particular project because it takes much longer to get it done. Uh, and in addition, following uh, uh, the, uh, the public hearing process, there's no guarantee that you'll even be allowed to build what the official community plan says that you, will, you were allowed to build. Um, so these are significant issues in my opinion, but that legislation is an option for cities. It's just one more tool for municipalities to use and it's not mandatory. Victor, did you have a follow-up? I did, yes. And uh, thanks for the answer, Minister. Appreciate that. Uh, so I, I guess how soon could we maybe see benefits of things like that, in your opinion, uh, with Bill 26, given that uh, it'll streamline processes and things like that? And, and also, I guess, if I can, you know, some of the uh, concerns we get a lot here in Kamloops is to do with the uh, catch and release and how some of the more prolific offenders, you know, they're caught by police and then they're released and then they just go back to doing what they were doing. And I guess the system isn't working. If you talk to people here, if you could maybe touch on that as well. Thanks. Sure. Um, so uh, we're already seeing cities taking up uh, the uh, offer of the provincial government to use this tool. So recently the city of North Vancouver, for example, uh, approved a rental housing building that was consistent with the official community plan, uh, approved the rezoning. Uh, without an additional public hearing, so they use that tool. So we're already seeing cities uh, adopt this in some places, which is great to see. Um, as for your, the second part of your question, this is a really important uh, part. It may not seem apparent uh, through the fact that we were talking about homelessness and so on, uh, but the complex care housing, there are, I would suggest, um, a couple of different uh, groups of people engaged in uh, activity that is uh, uh, property, minor property crime, disruptive behavior that results 
assaults and police being called. Uh, and uh, one of those groups are people struggling with serious mental health and addiction issues. We know from our recent homelessness count that was just shared yesterday that more than 50% of people who are homeless in British Columbia self-identify as having a mental health issue and more than 60% self-identify as having a, a, an addiction issue. Um, and so the complex care housing uh, that uh, is part of this budget, I hope, will have a significant impact in helping people stabilize because they're receiving health care services that support them in responding to the health conditions they face, namely that mental health and addiction issue. And so if you're dealing with a nurse, if you're dealing with uh, uh, a, a counselor that's helping you with life skills, if there are people making sure that you're getting your meds and so on, you're far less likely to end up in an emergency room, you're far less likely to end up uh, uh, dealing with police, and if you're inside, uh, that is uh, doubly true. And so uh, this complex care housing in the nature of health care really more than housing for those folks I think will significantly reduce uh, issues of street disorder in many communities uh, across the province. Uh, the second part is uh, people who are um, committing crimes for a commercial purpose or as part of an organized uh, uh, type of criminal activity. Um, certainly uh, I'm working with the uh, uh, Urban uh, Mayor's Caucus. Uh, they're bringing information to the provincial government. I'm working with my colleague Minister Mike Farnworth. Uh, because it is a serious issue in some communities and we do need to do uh, better on that and there are some opportunities for us to do better on that. Uh, I think that uh, unfortunately there's been some incorrect information reported uh, out of uh, Kelowna for example in relation to the role of Crown Council. Um, but uh, by working together I think we can overcome some of those things and I look forward to that. Our next question is from Cole Schisler, Black Press. Please go ahead. Uh, hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, earlier you talked about encampments, um, and I just wanted to know, so in the Cowichan Valley, the Cowichan Housing Association has had some really good success with these uh, small sleeping cabins that are kind of a step between living rough and being housed for folks. They're relatively cheap. I think they built about 40 sleeping cabins for around $300,000. As we wait for supportive and complex care housing to be built, why not roll out these sleeping cabin style encampments across the province? So there are, there are two parts to this. One is um, I'm really grateful to, to Cowichan for uh, uh, both the service provider and the city council for enabling this kind of experimentation for delivery of housing services. Um, so as uh, Minister Responsible for Housing, I'm fully supportive of these kinds of experiments to see if there are different ways of approaching uh, the problem of homelessness and tiny homes or these sleeping cabins are one way of doing that. In Victoria as well, uh, we did uh, a similar type of development, uh, this one with uh, converted uh, shipping containers into temporary housing. Um, the challenge with these sites is that they are in fact temporary and the major expense and, uh, and uh, issue with the site is, is operating uh, expenses, providing the services to the people uh, who live there. So um, in terms of services to the site, electricity, sewage, plumbing and all these kinds of things, uh, costs can rapidly escalate and start to approach uh, a more traditional modular housing development uh, which is uh, far more permanent than these temporary sites. So in some cities, uh, this is an appropriate and temporary response. In other cities, we're better to skip that step and go directly to modular. Uh, BC Housing is open to these kinds of proposals and cities that are interested in doing this or nonprofit organizations should bring them ahead. But they should also understand that the same life safety requirements apply, whether it's a converted shipping container, a sleeping cabin or so on. And lots of people with good ideas about uh, tiny homes often run into challenges with uh, fire safety and other issues. We, don't, we want people to be safe uh, in these housing units as well. So uh, it's an important tool, uh, but it's not going to be the full response to homelessness in communities. Cole, did you have a follow up? Yeah, uh, given that Indigenous people are overrepresented in, in, in the statistics of people who are homeless here in BC, they're overrepresented in the foster care system. Uh, what is the province doing in partnership with First Nations across the province to uh, reduce the number of Indigenous people who, uh, who fall into homelessness? Um, there are a couple of uh, pieces around our Indigenous housing response. So our province was the first uh, province in Canada 
to fund the construction of housing uh, on nation or on reserve for Indigenous communities. Uh, traditionally, provinces have pointed rightly to the federal government and their responsibility. But unfortunately, with the federal government failing to step up and deliver that necessary housing, we can't just bury our heads in the sand and say, well, you know what, that, that's, not our, uh, that's not our lane. So the province has stepped up and provided funding. What we've done is challenge the federal government, please match our funding uh, in terms of uh, building housing on nation, on reserve. Uh, this is a really important thing for the federal government to do. So we're trying to uh, shame them into action by actually directly funding uh, this housing. The second piece is uh, we're working with the uh, uh, Aboriginal Housing Management Association, AMA BC. They've recently developed a, uh, a housing strategy for the province, an Indigenous housing strategy. We're working with Aboriginal housing service providers in Metro Vancouver, who also have an association who have recommendations for us. And government is working in partnership with First Nations leadership and uh, nations to develop a homelessness an Indigenous homelessness strategy. Um, so we have a number of different pieces underway. Uh, the reason for this work, as you say, uh, our recent uh, homelessness count indicated uh, more than 35% of people who are homeless in British Columbia are Indigenous people, and yet in the 2016 census, only 6% of British Columbians uh, self-identified as Indigenous. So that uh, really disproportionate over-representation of Indigenous people in our homeless population is an injustice issue we need to deal with aggressively. We have time for one more question. Our final question today goes to Shannon Waters, BC Today. Please go ahead. Hi, this is a question for um, Minister Simons. I am trying to make heads or tails of uh, what you mentioned today, specifically the new shelter allowance and the minimum rate. Um, are you able to provide some more details on like what levels of supports are actually going to be available for people in terms of dollar figures? $75 really doesn't sound like a lot when it comes to trying to keep a roof over your head in this province these days. Minister Simons. Oh, thanks, Shannon, for the question. Um, this new $75 minimum for a single person um, is, is uh, aimed to sort of offset some of the incidental expenses associated with their, their living situation. So while they're not eligible for shelter allowance because they haven't got shelter to pay for, specifically, uh, the $75 per month um, will be uh, will go some way towards supporting their incidental expenses. So that, that'll be up to the individual on how they spend that fund. But uh, it was identified as a need and um, one that helps to support people who are uh, currently not housed. Shannon, Shannon did you have a follow-up? I do, and this one I think is going to go back to Minister Eby. Since we're talking about Budget 22, I wanted to ask about something that's not in it still, uh, the renter's rebate, which the NDP promised back in 2017. We've heard from the finance minister that it's coming at some point over the mandate. You've previously acknowledged that it's not really a policy solution per se, but something closer to the province acknowledging that it gives homeowners a subsidy every single year and renters... Uh, the average renter in BC does not benefit from that same support from the province. Can you explain why BC renters are still waiting on this policy, especially now when we're seeing rents rise once again and continuing to rise faster even than the annual uh, allowable increase just due to the demand that's out there? So we have taken a number of steps uh, to protect and promote the interests of renters since forming government. Uh, one of those really significant ones and one that flies below the radar is the 2% beyond inflation that used to be added to rents every year for renters. This is saving the average family in Surrey more than $2,000 a month uh, or $2,000 a year uh, in their rent. Uh, and, uh, and families across the province and individuals are benefiting from that. Uh, obviously, um, we believe uh, that there is an opportunity to do more. That's why uh, in the last election, uh, the Premier committed to delivering this uh, 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 renter's allowance um, before the, uh, uh, during the term of our government. Uh, the Ministry of Finance continues to do that work. 
Uh, and uh, I want to assure certainly all renters in the province that we continue to work, work hard to ensure affordability. And one of the best ways we believe that we can do that is to increase the availability of rental housing across the province and continue to monitor and restrict the ability to increase rents on tenants uh, who are currently living in their homes. That's all the questions we have for today. Thank you to everybody for joining. This concludes today's event. Thanks very much.